Hey there guys, so last time we ended up taking a look at this ITX PC that I put together with a Ryzen 5 5600G up against this boss game mini PC. Now this is rocking a Ryzen 5 6600H, and what we ended up finding in that is the fact that the 6600H actually has a lead over the 5600G, even though it is very limited in terms of memory bandwidth, especially considering the fact that the generation that it came out in, the DDR5 speeds at the time were pretty disastrous but what i really want to know is what a desktop apu versus a modern desktop apu is really like because when we really remove that memory bandwidth limit what ends up being the performance there so what we're going to be comparing this 5600g with is this right here this atx motherboard is pretty much a ryzen 5 8600g system now I wanted to originally make an ITX system similar to this one for the comparison purposes, but my God, are the prices for ITX motherboards that are either that are AM5 so expensive. On AliExpress is where I found the cheapest one that is about a hundred to a hundred and twenty dollars, depending on if you buy it on sale. Currently, it is available for around a hundred dollars, which is actually not that bad because if you look on American sites for an ITX motherboard that is am5 you're usually spending at least 150 to 200 dollars being able to get one for a hundred dollars is actually pretty rock solid but i didn't go down that route because all i did was go down to my local micro center and end up picking up cpu and the motherboard as a combo together but of course i'm stuck with an atx motherboard here but at the time that i was putting all of this together pretty much to get an equivalent setup like this was going to end up costing almost double the price and that just really was something i was not willing to do so what the combo here is, is this is a Ryzen 5 8600G, and that is rocking six Zen 4 cores, and the iGPU is the Radeon 760M, so the replacement of the iGPU that's in here. Now, there are some key differences versus what was in here versus what's in here. While this was a six core GPU based off of RDNA 2, this is an eight core GPU based off of RDNA 3. So not only are we getting the IPC uplift that came from going from RDNA two to rdna3 but we are also getting two more cores on the igp and i really think this should have been an eight core when they released it of course you can't blame boss game for that that was just a decision that amd made because they were trying to essentially sandbag here they really wanted the 680m to be just so much better that they were willing to sacrifice the ryzen 5s to get that so there are going to be some configuration differences here this i got with 16 gigabytes of ram and i can't use my 64 gigabyte kit because it isn't working well with this motherboard this has 32 gigabytes because that that's what this whole combo was it was the cpu motherboard and ram all together so that might end up affecting your ability to be able to play certain games depending on whether or not 16 gigabytes of ram is going to be enough so we're going to try to stick to games that are going to fit within the ram limitations of both of these now both systems are going to have overclocked igpus the igpu on this system is going to be running at 2.2 gigahertz while the igpu on this is going to be running at 3.1 gigahertz both of these over Overclocks were tested for stability. It's specifically why it's taken me a couple of days to get this video made. I had both of these systems running 24 seven in between, just waiting to make sure that all of the benchmark numbers are going to be accurate because I wanted this to be fully stable. Both systems managed to pass a 24 hour burn in in terms of the iGPU overclock. So I'm pretty confident that they are both stable and are going to give us some accurate numbers. So let's just jump right on into the testing to see see what the real difference is between these two systems. So of course the first game we're taking a look at is Black Myth Wukong running at 1080p with the lowest in-game graphics settings and we are using FSR with frame generation. And here we immediately are starting to see the big difference between these two iGPUs. Where the 5600G is just barely able to get a 30 FPS average with 1% lows that are just one frame underneath that, the 8600G is actually able to get an above 60 FPS average with 1% lows that are 1 FPS below that 60 FPS average. Keep in mind that we are using frame generation here. So the experience of trying to play on the 8600G is going to be noticeably better than on the 5600G since to get 30 FPS, we have to use frame generation. 
that is too low of a FPS to get an actual consistent and good experience out of frame generation. Though having frame generation on a lot of the times actually does end up being better than not having it on, even on the 5600G. Trust me, I've done the testing and I do notice the fact that frame generation actually does smooth out the frame times a lot of the time, even if it doesn't feel exactly perfect because it is fake frames that are being thrown in there, it's still just more consistent. But of course, the frame generation experience is just going to be so much better on the 8600G because of that higher FPS. It's still not at the ideal range. You'd ideally want to be between 40 to 60 FPS on an iGPU at least to really get the benefits of frame generation. But still, the fact that frame generation does actually help the game to go above 60 FPS is nice to see, especially since if you look at those frame time charts, they are at least consistent. So the next game that I took a look at is the Talos Principle 2, which is a game running on the Unreal 5 engine, and it does actually have a wide variety of different upscaling methods supported on here, as well as a wide assortment of different benchmarks, though this is one of the heaviest ones that they have. So for the upscaling, I did end up using the Temporal Anti-Aliasing Upscaling or TAAU since that is the default setting when you set everything to the lowest graphics settings. And as you can see here, we end up seeing a similar trend of effectively a doubling of both the FPS average and the 1% lows and actually getting this game to a very playable state. So after that, I took a look at Company of Heroes 3 running with the lowest in-game graphics settings and this time we are using FSR, but FSR at the quality preset and again, we end up seeing some pretty massive gains here where we're effectively seeing a doubling of the FPS average and again the same for the 1% lows. This is really showing a major generational leap and what this really means when it comes to you trying to play this game is that you don't need to just relegate yourself to the lowest graphical settings. You can actually start to turn things up and you won't really need to worry about it really affecting your FPS that dramatically. When you have an FPS average of 43, you don't really have a lot of wiggle room but when you have 94 that gives you some space to really mess with things. Now the next game we're taking a look at is Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord, an absolute favorite of mine, and it's running at 1080p with the low graphics settings. It's not the lowest, there's still one tier below this, but this is one above the lowest graphics settings. And this really just shows the difference between the two, because the 5600G really runs this game very well, even at the low graphics settings, but you throw in the 8600G and this just becomes a high refresh rate gaming experience. And what this actually means is that you don't need to play the game in potato quality settings. See, if you're a seasoned veteran of the Mountain Blade series, you probably know that Warband looked really bad when it came out. And Bannerlord has some pretty nice improvements graphically, but if you use the lowest or the low graphics settings, it very much looks a lot closer to Warband than it does Bannerlord. It's when you get to medium that things start to actually look really nice, where the difference between medium and the highest graphics settings are a lot lower than going from the lowest graphics settings up to medium. So medium is the ideal situation here, and the 8600G is going to let you use medium more than comfortably enough, where the 5600G is going to end up falling apart. Though both systems will be able to play the game perfectly fine with the, the low graphics settings, and if that is the route you decide to go with, the 8600G is at least going to let you use a high refresh rate display. So the next game we're going to be taking a look at is Tiny Tina's Wonderland running at 1080p with the low graphics settings. Remember, it is not the lowest graphics settings, there is one tier below this, but it is the low graphics settings. And this is with FSR, but FSR at the quality preset. And this is another one of those titles where you're seeing a pretty major difference. We're going from a barely 40 FPS average with 1% lows in the mid 30s to an almost 80 FPS average with 1% lows almost at 70. What this is going to let you do is again, just mess around with your graphics settings and really tailor the visual experience to just look a little bit better than just the bare minimum that you could usually get. Though this isn't the lowest graphics settings that you can go with, really the tier below this visually speaking doesn't necessarily come with that big of a difference it's just a slight reduction in overall quality versus this while jumping up to medium start to see some more graphical improvements and this is going to let you actually go in between that low to medium graphics settings and of course thanks to features like fsr we're able to just get a better overall experience without really having to sacrifice all that much visually and of course now we're taking a look at returnal one of those titles that has absolutely destroyed 
most of the mini PCs we've ever tested it on. As you can see here, the 5600G with the lowest in-game graphics settings and FSR with the performance preset can't even get a 30 FPS average and those 1% lows are disastrous as you can tell by the, that frame time chart. And while the 760M isn't exactly doing amazing, by comparison, it's actually doing a really rock solid job. 1% lows are at 31 with an FPS average of 47. That actually is a playable experience. It's not perfect, but it, it is at least playable as opposed to the 26 FPS average with a 16 1% low. In particular, those 1% lows going down into the teens are, means that you're going to be in for a rough time. And now we're taking a look at another all-time favorite of mine. It is Hitman World of Assassination, formerly known as Hitman 3. Here you can see the game running with the lowest in-game graphics settings, and we are using FSR, but it is FSR at the quality preset, and you can see that with the 5600G, we are getting an FPS average that is approaching 40, and 1% lows that are almost at 30. That's a pretty playable experience, as you can tell by the frame time chart. There's the occasional spike here and there, but it is going to be consistent enough that it should be playable, though not ideal. Meanwhile, on the 8600G, we're getting 1% lows that are clearing past 60, and we have an FPS average that is at 86. That means, again, you are put into a position where you can start to mess around with the graphics settings so you don't so you don't have to play the game at potato graphics quality. And it's great that we're able to use FSR here without having to get really aggressive with the settings. If we got aggressive with it, I'm pretty sure we could get this game to be playable on the 5600G at a really great experience if we went down to balanced or even in performance but do keep in mind that at that point you're really sacrificing the visuals there but of course if you have a 5600g and you want to play the game it's pretty much the best way to go about it without having to shell out any more money to buy a whole new system and as for the last game we're taking a look at it is counter-strike 2 counter-strike 2 is an interesting game here it is running at the lowest in-game graphics settings and we do have fsr disabled and it's interesting because on pretty much every mini pc that i've taken a look at running a vega igpu this game really does not run well on them at all. So it was interesting when the 5600G was actually running it surprisingly well. While it's not the most ideal 1% lows, specifically because this is a title where you want to have as high of an FPS as humanly possible, this is still a very playable experience, especially if you're not someone that is an absolute sweat lord. But there is a clear gap in terms of performance here where we're now getting a very comfortably high FPS gaming experience out of the 8600G. It is pretty much the ideal ideal scenario for a title like this because that means that if you have a 144 hertz monitor you're able to take full advantage of it of course i don't think you're going to be winning any majors playing on a system like this but you're at least not going to be held back if you're playing up against your friends that have desktop pcs with full dedicated graphics cards because at the end of the day if they don't have a display that could actually show that very high refresh rate it effectively doesn't mean anything all right so after all that testing something is very clear. The 8600G is a true generational improvement over the 5600G. We're not looking at the usual 20 to 30 percent improvement from generation to generation, we are looking at a doubling of performance. Of course, that's a little misleading because what ended up happening on the desktop is they skipped the 6000 series. So that means RDNA 2 never actually saw a desktop release. So instead of going from Vega to RDNA 2 the same way that it was on mobile, we actually ended up seeing Vega to RDNA 3, so there was a massive generational improvement there. And it shows since in the vast majority of the games that we tested, we were looking at about double the performance. But of course, you might have also noticed that that's not the full story here. You were looking at the power usage of the 8600G, you were noticing that it was also using noticeably more power than this system. And in that scenario, it's not exactly great. Of course, there is an overclock on the iGPU here, but that was the exact same scenario here. So both of them are using more juice than what they would naturally use. But clearly the 8600G was just using significantly more power. Does it really matter at the end of the day? I think that for the vast majority of people, it really won't because even though this was using noticeably more power than this, at the end of the day, it's still significantly less power than what a traditional gaming computer would end up doing. And this was getting some great results in a lot of these titles where they even get them to be even remotely playable or not even playable at all. On the 5600G, we had 
had to use the lowest settings possible with FSR, sometimes at its most aggressive settings. Well, with the 8600G, we actually had more than enough headroom that we could start turning up some graphics settings. So you're not just relegated to only playing modern games at their absolute lowest settings. You can actually have a little bit of wiggle room here. And all this is really just done is it's really tempted me to get an 8700G. Because if this is how good eight RDNA 3 cores are performing on a desktop, I would be very curious to see what the full 12 cores could actually do. I would like to also at some point do a comparison between the 8700G versus the highest end APU that we can actually get on the market right now from AMD, AI HX 370 CPU that has the 890M. Thank God they still at least have remotely normal sounding names for their iGPUs, but my God, those product names are getting ridiculous. But I would be very interested in testing that out against both the 8600G and the 8700G. So I might just have to keep an eye out for any sales happening out there unless some company decides to send me an AI PC. So far, no one has been willing to do that, which I mean, I guess is fine. I realistically don't want to recommend them to anybody anyway because of the, their price points are just ridiculous. I just can't in good conscience recommend an over $1,000 mini PC to anyone unless you have just a very, very specific reason that you need a powerful mini PC that wouldn't benefit from just having a full-sized graphics card. It just becomes far too niche. But anyways, let me know what you think. Check out the merch store down below as always. And remember, you can become a channel member for as little as a dollar a month. I appreciate everyone that does that. It really helps out a lot. But I'll catch you guys in the next one.